very excited to be here. Um, so I thought I'll, I'll talk a little bit about ideas around causal representation learning and why I think this is an important topic at this intersection um, between biology and machine learning. Um, I like to start just with this little picture here, um, because I know we're all super excited about this area um, because of this explosion of data sets and just to show how crazy it kind of is. is um, so this is just a genomics platform at the Broad, so no imaging data at all. Um, the amount of data that was produced just last year was 80 petabytes. Um, and in fact, if you just look at this curve, it's the same curve as Twitter. Um, and so that's again, that's just genomics, so no imaging data at all. So uh, the biological and the biomedical sciences are very, very quickly outgrowing basically all other areas in terms of data generation. Um, but what is kind of surprising, at least still to me, is that the key drivers of foundational developments in machine learning and AI are still not the biomedical sciences. Um, for the, the key drivers for the foundational developments are things like, you know, recommender systems, um, online advertising, self-driving cars, robotics, etc. Um, and here in all these applications, uh, one has come very, very far by just directly trying to optimize prediction accuracy. If you're thinking, of like um, some recommender system, for example, right? It's probably not that important that you understand why if someone is interested in sunscreen, this person might also be interested in ice cream. Um, they don't really need to understand the underlying mechanisms or reasons why that's actually the case. Whereas in the biomedical field, often the ultimate goal is, is to actually get at mechanisms, is to understand, for example, how genes regulate each other, which protein is malfunctioning in a particular disease context in order to then be able to target it um, and identify. Again, there you need to understand mechanisms and you need to understand what is downstream um, of this particular protein um, and what actually moves you then maybe back uh, more towards a normal state. So we really need to go from this um, just purely prediction to actually understanding something about the underlying causal mechanisms. And so the question is, how do we go to causality? Of course, um, we all know that's difficult um, if we don't have experimental data or, or if we cannot perform targeted experiments. But of course, in the biomedical field, and that is maybe unique um, as compared to many other fields, we do have really amazing tools for performing large scale perturbations. We have genetic tools, we have chemical tools um, where we we can very, very targeted um, perform um, perturbations of single genes, of like just particular positions in the genome, et cetera, and then actually see what happens downstream. And of course, that helps for getting at mechanisms, right? If you think here, if you take a, if you want to understand whether, you know, some like a good weather increases ice cream consumption or whether it's the other way around, if you can take a gloomy day and, you know, give out a whole lot of free ice cream and you realize that the weather doesn't change, then you know that, you know, free ice cream consumption is not upstream of good weather, right? So this is like how uh, perturbation screens can actually really help you at getting at or, or is the tool for getting at the underlying causal mechanism. Um, but since, you know, no other field really has access to large scale, um, such large scale perturbations, there is some M machine learning theory, but of course not a targeted machine learning theory to actually deal with such large scale perturbational um, screens. And in fact, if you just, you know, look at your standard representation learning tools or generative AI tools, they can really not deal with interventions. So here, for example, even if you tell it that, you know, um, here you ask Dali to make a picture of, you know, an ice cream stand and you tell it that this ice cream stand is giving out free ice cream, it will always put good weather in the background. Okay, it doesn't understand that in that case, you know, it's like independent of whatever the weather, basically independent of whatever the weather is um, in the background, right? It should have sometimes rainy, it's certainly more often rainy than if you just ask it to give you, you know, an ice cream stand um, and show you a picture of an ice cream stand. So none of these methods really can deal with, with interventional data or, or trying to understand the effect of an intervention and that this actually has no effect upstream of wherever you're intervening on. Um, so I think biology is really uniquely suited to, you know, actually driving new foundational developments in machine learning. And in order to have the biggest impact, we do need new foundational developments in machine learning um, in order to really then be able to as most effectively impact biology. Um, so now, uh, one way that we I, I didn't see on, on the discussion slide, and I think, you know, I think it is important for us to think through is how can we actually invite more machine learning researchers into biology, right? And I think there are a lot of people around that are actually would want to work on more important problems than, you know, recommender systems or online advertising, but just don't have an access to actually, um, you know, getting into these biomedical, important biomedical questions. 
Um, and so we, and the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center, we're, we started to organize large scale um, competitions um, where we invite machine learning. First of all, we make these problems accessible to people who have no biology background by actually teaching lectures, et cetera, uh, short courses before the competition. Um, but also, I mean, what is important is one comes up with an important biological problem. But what we really want is that machine learning oh. researchers actually have a say in what the next experiment is that will be run. Okay, not just, you know, here's a data set and, you know, I'm keeping out some data and then I'm going to just uh, rank all kinds of uh, predictions of people. But I think what is the more important problem is, you know, here is an initial data set. What is the next experiment that should, we should be running? Um, and we're currently running these experiments that were predicted um, by within this competition. And here uh, the question is about um, cancer immunotherapy, um, where, you know, these are um, T cells. And uh, what we have performed is 70 different um, knockout experiments in a mouse. Um, where we get to see what happens when you do a particular knockout experiment. Um, here, we're just uh, distinguishing um, five different uh, states of T cells. So they can either be cycling, they can be terminally exhausted. That's what you want to move them away from for immunotherapy. Um, they can be in this um, highly effective state or they can be in this progenitor state, which is also a state that you like to have because then these T cells can move to the effector state. Um, and then everything else we just um, categorized as others in this state. And so we're asking, you know, here are 70 uh, different knockouts that we've done. Um, we show you all the data that comes out of these. Um, you get to see, you know, for every perturbation, you get to see what happens, whether you are um, now more in the terminal exhausted state or now maybe you're more in the factor state, et cetera. And we're asking which other perturbation should we run um, that could actually, um, you know, um, lead us to less cells in the terminal exhausted state and more cells in the cycling effector or progenitor state. And so these validation experiments are currently underway, but I think it would be exciting to think through like also together, um, you know, what could be good questions to ask and what are a data sets where we can then cycle through and, and like really have um, a, you know, a, a competition in terms of like, you know, there will be new experiments that will be run based on the predictions that come out of this. And of course, this can then continue on and continue on. Okay, so that's one way of hoping um, here. I mean, also the people who have all, so some of the challenges were able already able to um, to actually uh, rank, and there were even people who have literally never worked on biology, like come out of information theory, for example, who have won some of the first challenges. So it's exciting to see people that have never done any biology actually get into this field. And I think we can learn a lot from the methods that they come up with that, you know, nobody here, or at least I think we wouldn't be able to come up with just because they come from a completely different field. Um, so, but going back to, you know, perturbations and, and how we generally think about this, um, so often in, in terms of trying to predict the effect of an intervention, a genetic intervention, um, we would think of it in this, um, you know, these gene regulatory um, network kinds of ways um, where, you know, this is kind of the gold standard, right, of coming up with these amazing um, gene regulatory networks, which tell us exactly what happens if you perturb somewhere something, you have like differential equations and all these edges, and it will tell us what actually happens downstream of it. Um, and so the standard framework um, from causality was developed by Sewell Wright, um, and, you know, is this causal structural equation models um, that can really reason through if I intervene on a, on a particular node, what actually then happens downstream. Um, and so, you know, here often we would only have data on the nodes, right, and which would be, for example, gene expression data on the nodes, so every node here would be a gene, um, and we would like to actually learn these, um, these edges here, which co would correspond to these regulatory relationships. Um, and now this field, uh, Peter Spertus has laid the foundations for causal discovery from observational data. We've done a lot of work on actually understanding how many samples are needed in order to really be able to learn these networks just from data. Um, and even if we have interventional data, um, and so here, I think, you know, generally now, I mean, I think we have a pretty good understanding. This is not based on an algorithm. These are actually fundamental limitations of how hard causal inference is. Um, so here we generally go with, you know, you need like 
even the current data sets of like, say, 100,000 to a million samples are only sufficient to learn something like a network on 10 to 100 nodes. So you'll never be able to go to something like 20,000 nodes. Now, this is, um, we saw a really nice talk uh, by Smita this morning, where she had Granger causality in it. So, so this is a different form of causality, right? Because we don't actually, here, we're not assuming that we have time series information. So when you have time series information, the problem becomes much easier because you already know uh, the direction and time. So edges can only point forward. Um, so this is, uh, all these results are if you have just data from, say, a steady state, then you actually want to get at causality. Okay, so this is generally the limitations of it. Um, I think, you know, we'll never be there that we can just learn from data a network on 20,000 nodes. I will just never, simply never have the data set sizes, even with, you know, assuming that the sample sizes are growing like crazy. Um, so then the question is, of course, what can we do um, if not, you know, trying to actually learn these gene regulatory networks directly, even from a huge amount of interventional data, even if you can intervene on every node. Um, and so here are two problems that we have been um, discussing a lot in the group and, and um, are something that we're excited about because I, we think that they are quite fundamental, but um, are not, might not require actually learning a full gene regulatory network in order to be able to answer them. And they are underlying a lot of important biomedical questions. Um, so one of them being uh, just transporting to new contexts. So say you have like different perturbations um, in one, say, cell type or one disease state, and now you would like to predict what the same perturbations do in a different disease state or a different cell type, or, you know, the fundamental question would be being able to move from mouse to human, right? This is like all of what pharma industry would like to do is I have a particular drug in one in mice, I know what it does, and I would like to predict what it actually does in, in humans. And the other one is um, actually um, translating or transporting across different perturbations. So the space of possible perturbations is huge. It can be all kinds of different genetic perturbations. You may want to go to combinations. Um, like, for example, uh, we would like to at some point in, in, for immunotherapy, right, be actually able to predict the effect of combinations, not just single gene knockouts. Um, or different drugs, right? The space of, of possible compounds is huge. Um, so could you, from the ones that we have already observed, actually predict some unseen ones? Um, so these are all causal questions because it's always about interventions. Um, it's transporting interventions across different contexts or transporting to new interventions. And also I put here um, different data modalities because um, you know we often think of when we're thinking about gene regulation, we're thinking about it as we have gene expression data, we have these gene regulatory networks. However, of course, it's still much cheaper to get imaging data. And we do have a whole lot of um, now with the jump consortium and, and you know, cell painting data, we have a huge amount of right interventional um, single cell data where we have many, many, many different perturbations applied to them. Um, and so then the question, of course, becomes, well, how do you get to causality from images, right? Um, so, you know, what are even the causal features? I mean, we always assume when we draw our networks, we always assume that every gene is a node and we try to learn these networks among these genes. Well, but, you know, in an image, for sure, not every pixel is a, is a causal variable, right? Because a pixel one here has nothing to do with pixel one over here. Um, but, you know, what we would expect to be causal variables are maybe like how much of a transcription factor is inside the nucleus or what is the shape of the cell or what is the shape of the nucleus or, you know, uh, where is a particular protein inside the cell, etc. So we don't even know what the causal features are. <laughs> we actually have to learn the causal features. And I would argue even in the genetic setting here, I mean, we just, because we measure gene expression along genes, we just always draw it as the genes are our causal features. But it's not really clear that genes are, that that's the right level of actually thinking about causal features. Um, so how do we think, how do we learn causal features um, when we have, say, imaging data? Um, and can maybe multimodal, um, multimodality help us? Can interventions help us? So these are the types of questions that we like to think about. And I'll just provide some ideas around this. Um, so first, I would like to suggest that multimodality can actually help um, to discover causal features. And also interventions can help in similar ways to discover causal features. Um, so here is work that we did um, actually without causality in it originally, but we were always thinking that there should be a causal angle to it, um, where we take single cell um, DAPI images and we take single cell RNA-seq. 
And of course, these could not at that time, now with spatial transcriptomics, they can kind of be actually measured basically um, paired way. So I'll also show you something in spatial transcriptomics afterwards. But, you know, here they were unpaired. So we used autoencoders in order to both embed them into a joint latent space. And then, you know, you add another classifier, say, in the latent space, which is punished if you can detect whether it comes from imaging land or sequencing land. So these were T cells, so same population of cells, some were taken out for imaging, some for sequencing. So in the latent space, it should actually be the same population of cells. Um, and so how should this like latent space actually help you to get a causal features? What is even the, the underlying um, idea? Um, well, you know, so what should be a causal feature? Well, a causal feature should be something that doesn't depend on whether you look at your system from the left or from the right, right? Or whether I look at it from like one modality or from another modality, whatever is a causal feature should actually be invariant to it. And so that's the underlying idea that actually multimodal data can help you to look at, to identify what is really invariant to all of the different views uh, that you could have. Um, and, you know, yes, we, we used it already here, but um, we do have proofs now, at least uh, starting proofs, and these are the types of things that we're very excited about, where, you know, if you have a latent causal graph, so everything here is latent, right, so that's why it's called causal representation learning, so all these variables here are latent, so our whole causal system is latent, we just know, we get to see, like, multimodal data, so a function that maps out of this latent space, and for now, all our proofs are just in a very simple setting, everything is linear, um, there we can really prove that multimodality does allow you to actually identify the under oops sorry does allow you to actually identify the underlying causal features okay so so it is in fact the case that multimodal data does allow you to actually get at what these like literally identify what these causal features here are um, and of course there is a lot to be done in terms of um, also having nonlinear results etc um, but at least this does suggest that the intuition is correct, that multimodality allows you to get a causality at even latent causal features. Um, and similar results we have also obtained um, when you actually have interventional data. Um, so what I want to do now is like, okay, so all of this is linear. As I said, like here, um, what we are using is autoencoders generally, right, to map into a shared latent space. Um, another question that I think we should spend much more time on is how do we actually develop neural, I mean, all of us use neural networks, how do we actually develop neural networks where we understand their inductive biases and their inductive biases are actually aligned with the biological questions of interest. So we spend also a lot of time on, on trying to understand um, neural networks and trying to um, build neural networks where we actually understand what they're doing and why they're doing it, and then using these um, for our biological applications. And here maybe just briefly, um, you know, a little bit of an overview. I think we all know that, you know, neural networks have become so great and generalized so well when we have been making them larger and larger, right? So all neural networks basically nowadays are trained to zero training error. So the, the question is, why do they generalize? And I guess we all know, I mean, double descent, et cetera. But like, I, I think, you know, this is like kind of always in the classification setting, we always want to be over parameterized, right? We always want to get to zero training error. Um, and so what was kind of surprising for us actually is that nobody even really proved that neural networks can be optimal classifiers, so they, they can be base optimal. Um, and so we recently did this and we also characterized um, what, what activation functions do give rise to base optimal classifiers. Um, and this is in the setting where we take neural networks and we just let them become larger and larger. So this is like, then you get to infinitely wide neural networks, and then you can even make them infinitely deep. Um, and in that setting, you can show that they are, in fact, base optimal um, classifiers, and we can provide which um, activation functions are base optimal. Now, what is interesting is that's none of the standardly used activation functions like ReLU, Leaky ReLU, et cetera, none of the ones. However, the optimal ones are actually very simple ones. There are some polynomials of degree three that you can actually implement. So that's quite nice that you can have theory that tells you, that guides you in terms of what kinds of activation functions should you actually be choosing. Now, of course, most of us never do classification. Um, so I think many of us are usually in the representation learning setting where we don't have, you know, some nice class labels. Um, and so here we work mainly with autoencoders, again, just because we do have the theory of understanding what types of autoencoders should we be using. Um, and now motivated by these results that, you know, we should be over parameterized and, and make these neural networks larger and larger, 
Auto encoders, of course, always had like this bottleneck in them, right? Like auto encoder was always like you go into this lower dimensional latent space um, and you have this bottleneck and this helps you because, you know, you're trying to minimize reconstruction error and this, you know, this bottleneck will just keep as much information as needed. Well, um, so if you go over parameterized, what that means is we actually use always a larger dimensional latent space um, than what you start off with. So again, we will always get training error zero, same as the intuition for classification. Um, but, and now, you know, the, why these were never used is that these could actually just learn the identity map, right? Because I don't have any bottleneck in there anymore. But we proved that that's not the case. So if you just, you know, I mean, the proofs are always gradient descent, but then you see exactly the same phenomenon, stochastic gradient descent. Um, so what happens is the functions that are learned are actually very nice functions. So they are contractive at the training examples. So what you can do is train your over-parameterized autoencoder and now just take, you know, whatever, an image and where you add on some noise on top of it, take a training image with, with added on noise and you map it through your autoencoder. Then what comes out is something that looks very similar to what you put in, right? So, um, so this we know from autoencoders, but, you know, if it was the identity map, then if you would iterate the map, it would remain in that image. But you'll, if you iterate it, you will actually end up with one of your training examples. So that means that it's highly contractive, and we proved that it's contractive at all of the training examples, which is a good thing. You don't want the map that, you know, if you put in a test image that is very, very close to a training image, that maps it to something that is very far away from the training image, right? That would be a very problematic map um, that could be learned by an autoencoder, and that's actually not done. So these are the kinds of autoencoders that we always use. Um, and so that's just a second idea, like we should really be using uh, neural networks where we understand um, what our inductive biases are. And, you know, how I can show you now what actually happens with these autoencoders. So here is, for example, the spatial transcriptomics setting, where we again have like different data modalities that are put into a joint latent space. And in fact, this over-parameterization, you don't need any batch correction. So here you see from four different mouse brains um, how the clusters come out. Um, they're all nicely consistent. Whereas if you use your standard autoencoder, right, it, it like classifies different regions of the brain um, together with different things. Um, so it's very clear that this is probably not the type of, um, the type of uh, latent space uh, that you actually want to get out. Um, and again, we now we understand when it works and why it works, et cetera. So we already knew beforehand that, you know, over parameterization in this case will just be able to remove batch effects directly. And so you don't need to do anything else with like, you know, all these other things that are generally done and like trying to match latent spaces, et cetera. Um, similarly, what you can also do is in medical settings, um, you can integrate all kinds of different data modalities like say part MRIs or ECGs, et cetera, is what we did here. And again, you can show that the latent spaces are more causal in the sense that um, here, in fact, what you get out, you can get much more powerful analysis for doing genome-wide association studies in the latent space. Um, and you can do this again in an unsupervised fashion, right? So, so because we're doing everything in the latent space, I don't need to tell you what I'm looking at in terms of the state of the cardiovascular system. Um, I can just do genome-wide association studies for any direction in this latent space. Okay, so that was um, the second idea. Now, um, the last one um, is, you know, I'm back to this problem, right? And um, what I want to do is either uh, transport to new contexts or transport to new perturbations. And um, all I want to show here is um, maybe one more thing, again, motivated um, by, you know, everything we know now about inductive biases of these neural networks. Well, we do want to let them go grow larger and larger. Well, let's actually let them go to infinity. Um, and so what we know um, now is then if you let your neural network go to infinite width, um, for example, then what you get out is a particular kernel, um, which is known as the neural tangent kernel. And it's really nice because, you know, um, training larger and larger neural networks takes more and more computation time. But the interesting thing is that if you go to infinity, it actually is a kernel that you can write down in closed form. So suddenly you don't have to train anymore. Um, and here, all we did is actually build a neural tangent kernel for matrix completion. Um, so, you know, if we go back, all of these problems are basically matrix completion problems, right? Where I have here um, different perturbations, say on the rows and different contexts on, on the columns. So like here, for example, I'm taking CMAP. So I have different perturbations on the rows, different um, contexts like disease contexts, in this case, cancers on the columns. And, you know, I have some perturbations that I know the effect of, and I want to predict what this particular perturbation does in this new cancer context. 
Um, and here, just by using you know these these neural these infinite um, neural networks and nothing else, you can just directly beat any of the previous methods uh, that were developed for exact for just particularly this kind of context of actually trying to predict the effect of perturbations across new contexts or in a particular context try to predict an effect of a new perturbation. Um, so, so that just shows you the power of actually understanding what the neural networks do underlying it and how much you can get out of it by super simple. I mean, this is like a super simple method that you can apply on these things. Okay, so with that, I will end um, and um, just summarize. I think biology has the potential to inspire really new and profound avenues of machine learning research, which I think is very exciting. Um, what we need is theoretical and algorithmic frameworks um, for integrating integrating and translating between different data modalities, and this in particular also in the interventional setting to really get at causality. Um, current representation learning frameworks generally fail miserably at predicting the effect of interventions, and so we really need to somehow marry together causality and representation learning. Um, and we do need neural networks where we understand what their inductive biases are um, so that we can align them with the biological problems of interest. And I hope I was able to show some interesting examples where, you know, if we understand the autoencoders can really give us intuition to what these neural networks do, and that overparameterization can actually be our friend, um, in particular in these biological applications. And another topic, this is maybe more for discussion that I haven't seen there, which I think would be interesting to discuss more is active learning and how we can have like more a better loop between experiments and, and predictions. Um, and, you know, that we should, there are so many different experiments that we could be performing um, that I think we do need more active learning approaches that can actually deal with this huge space of, of different of possible, in this case, perturbations or other types of experiments. And with that, I'll end um, and my acknowledgements. I wouldn't be able to do any of this work without an amazing group, um, not just PhD students and um, um, undergraduate students and postdocs, but I'm particularly also collaborators, in particular, all of the biological work that I do has all been in collaboration with GV Shiva Shankar's group at ETH Zurich, and then, of course, funding, without which it would also not be possible. And thank you all.